Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege and uh, an honor to be with you today uh, discussing a topic which is close to your heart and close to the heart of many policymakers within the European Union and their member states. Special thanks to the European Disability Forum and the European Commission for sponsoring such event. Special thanks for ERA for uh, hosting for a number of years these events and special thanks to you for coming uh, one more time to hear, to participate and voice your expertise, your profound expertise in member states about issues on equal treatment and non-discrimination of uh, disabled persons across the European Union and its member states. My apologies for not being able to join you yesterday at the wonderful dinner that ERA provided, but I'm suffering from uh, the inevitable plane bug, so I'll just pray that I will go through my presentation without a, a hiccup. I'd like to spend some time today talking about what is the implication of the requirements of the Convention for the Protection of uh, Rights of Disabled People uh, in the Member States of the European Union. The implications are basically on focus on one word, accessibility. And accessibility is a magic word. Access is a magic word in the European Union policy and lawmaking. Access to the market, access to public services, access to also opportunities. That is the fundamental foundation of policymaker priority after the elections, after the eighth legislature is finishing this May. And the new parliament will set up priorities for the years to come. As you're aware, everything that relates into accessibility of rights, physical or technical rights that they are enshrined to make life of disabled people um, equal with other people, other citizens, everything focuses on the compliance with uh, the public procurement framework. That relates into the ability of the public sector, the government, the local government, the bodies governed by public law, across the European Union member states to organize services, works, that are compatible with accessibility requirements. The rules that relate into public procurement focus on four major families of legislation. The directives, the procurement directives. You're aware, I hope that uh, the basic directives on public sector utilities and concessions were implemented in 2016. So there are young directives, the young legal instruments that are purport to bring together the new thinking process of the European Union for delivering public contracts. In fact, providing the necessary conduit between public and private sector to deliver public services. The most important legal instrument that you will have to face for the concept of accessibility is focusing on the public sector directive. Directive 2014-24, 85 to 90% of all cases that relate into the accessibility requirements on the convention and also some other policy developments will go through that directive. And if you bear in time, you will see exactly how these problems can be solved or can be hindered at the later stage of today. A bit of good news. The first concept that the public sector directives tells the member states is a concept called discretion. However, very few member states grab this concept. 
Why? Because they don't want to. They're afraid of. They're afraid of challenges. Article 1 of the Public Sector Directive focuses on the subject, matter, and scope of the instrument. That directive is implemented in member states by specific national legislation. So Article 1 is implemented across the European Union accordingly. What Article 1 tells us? It tells us that member states, contracting authorities, the government, the local government, bodies governed by public law, universities, local authority organizations, councils, and also public institutions have tremendous discretion in taking anything that relate into services of general economic interest outside procurement. This is the big leap of faith here, that member states can use that discretion pursuant to Article 14 of the Treaty of Functioning of the European Union and Protocol 26 to bypass the competitive environment envisaged by public procurement directives. It's music in the ears of many policymakers at national level. But it's also a chimera. It's also something which is not materialized because of the lack of brave character on the part of member states to envisage a link between accessibility, the concept of accessibility, and services of general economic interest. They don't make that link as yet. Hopefully, the next parliament, the next European parliament, will have that as a priority to link and avoid unnecessary tendering, unnecessary complications out of contesting the market to provide accessibility requirements for uh, allowing disabled people to access, to create close link with services that are destined for the public. The Convention also for the protection, the rights of disabled people, has a, a great article, Article 9. You're aware of that, and you're aware that Article 9 focuses on that concept of accessibility. It has three objectives, the independent living, the full participation in all aspects of life, from professional to social, to voting, to participation in democratic institutions. And last but not least, it has a principle that underpins the entire interface. That principle is equal treatment. The measures that they will implement the objectives of Article 9 are focusing on the physical environment, the buildings, the train stations, the infrastructure, the planes, the technical infrastructure, the computers, transportation, not only the access to the train station, but also access to the rolling stock or the plane. The information and communication systems that move completely the entire interface of delivering of public services from physical to ICT related. And last but not least, the facilities and services destined for the public. That's the equalization, that's the equal treatment with all persons in the society. These are the measures that you will see in any type of contract, in any type of arrangement between the public and the private sector to deliver public services that they're destined to be compatible with Article 9 of the Convention. Article 9 highlights 
the accessibility as a minimum standard. That's important. That's important from a lawmaking point of view and also from the implementation point of view. A minimum standard is also a magic word for compliance. It's not the maximum ceiling standard. It's the minimum standard, the minimum requirement you should expect for legal compliance. And it's a shame that the European system didn't require minimum standard, but the convention came with that specific mention, minimum standards. Remember that wonderful expression, two words, minimum standards. We'll see later on how will it relate to the implementation. Another piece of good news I would like to offer you is Article 106 of the Treaty on Functioning of the European Union. You heard from my esteemed colleague Andrea Broderick yesterday about how the Convention interacts with the European Union law. Great presentation, great inside knowledge. I'd like to delve a bit more into a specific part of the European Union law, primary European law, an article of the treaty, Article 106, which focuses on a great foundation, a great base for what we call public services. In many states, the member states you coming, the concept of a public service differs from your neighbor states difference for between Italy and, for example, Spain, or UK and Holland, or uh, Sweden and Slovakia. However, Article 106 creates a blanket, creates a net approach of what are the requirements for a universal notion of public services in Europe. One of the characteristics of the public services, it's a concept of obligation. It's the so-called PSO, public service obligation. What does it mean? It means one thing, that the member state, the government, is obliged by law, by statute, to perform these services through constitutional requirements or through specific legislative designated measures. Keep that in mind. Number two, Article 106 is the basis for a concept called universal service obligations. Minimum standards. Remember what I told you a few minutes ago, the minimum standard that is translated as part of the United Nations Convention is found now on this wonderful expression of universal service obligations. That means whatever is accepted to your country in the South universally should be accepted in other parts of the European Union. Universal standards obligation is the opposite side of the coin called minimum standards. Who said that? 106, that's your friend. That's your friend for implementing accessibility through procurement in member states. The last two concepts that come to our help in deciphering the rules that relate into accessibility requirements through procurement contracts are focusing on a distinction between services of general economic interest and services of social economic interest. That's a combination of two requirements that the member state will need to enter the market, provide these services that have a differentiated facade. It could be of economic interest or it could be of social interest. You can ask me, what's the difference? Huge. It's a massive difference. A services of general economic interest means that they are valued. There is a value. Not only a price, but there is a value. That means profit. That means contestability from competitive forces. Or contrary, 
as services of social interest is devoid of this requirement. As services of social interest do not have the element of profitability, only the obligation on the part of the member state to provide these services. Who said that? 106 in combination with Protocol 26. This is again a definition of what I mentioned to you about Article 20, Article 106 and Protocol 26 of the Treaty on Functioning of the European Union. It covers the economic dimension of quite a few social services or economic services of general interest. What we need to take into account for designing a national framework for accessible procurement that complies and confronts the requirements of minimum standards of Article 9 of the Convention is defining in member states the characteristics of public services, which of course should be economic in nature, but they have a cost and value. They have a cost and value consideration. Everything has a cost. Even governments have a cost. But the value, as I mentioned to you, focuses on profitability, which indicates industrial or commercial character. In other words, it's a sui generis marketplace. The accessibility requirement that corresponds into the provision of public services in a member state or within the European Union have limited use of antitrust. You cannot have competition requirements based on that. You cannot have Article 101 or Article 102 for dominance or abuse of dominance or cartels. In theory, you could, but in practice, it's impossible to see that interface coming into that segment on the market. That also has another implication, that state aid regulation is completely out of the equation. You don't have to worry about state aid. And you know that many states, many governments, are paranoid about breaching not only competition and also dominance regulations, but mainly state aid. They're afraid of favoring an undertaking, public or private, in their own jurisdiction that might impeach any aspect of competitiveness across the intra-community trade. Last but not least, the European institutions use that kind of a catch-all provision to give comfort to member states, to policymakers, to law enforcement in member states, law enforcement in terms of European compliance. And that is procurement as a benchmark. Many member states would like to see the benchmark of delivering public services through procurement. It's a kind of a conveyor belt. It's a type of assurance or insurance of complying with the European acquis for the basic principles. Free movement of goods, right of establishment, freedom to provide services. So you have that background behind the concept of the public services and also the concept of the requirements of what is meant to be providing public services. As a conclusion, for the conceptual premises of services of general economic interest, I'd like you to remember that these services have no commercial value. But at the same time, they require huge interface with demand, frequency of supply, the quality requirements for the services, potential charges for the end user, and also concept of profitability of the operator. Is the operator who break, break even? 
will require huge subsidy on the part of the member state to provide these services in perpetuity or through another mechanism you could create some degree of uh, break-even scenario neutral budgeting in other words for these services we thought about that quite often in the parliament when i had the honor to give some evidence on these services of general interest and also the financing of them the requirements are clear to everybody article 14 and protocol 26 makes very clear the requirements the problem is the implementation which indicate one thing how you're going to finance that how the member states will finance these services in our case how the member states will finance accessibility requirements for disabled people that's a big question which is remaining unsolved unfortunately today across the European Union one thing I like to mention to you briefly is that in many member states services of general economic interest relied on the concept of the public service obligation through an act of entrustment it could be constitution if your member state has a constitution or some member states for example the united kingdom doesn't have a constitution there has to have a written constitution it has some sort of principles unwritten principles so quite wisely protocol 26 focuses on the concept of an act of entrustment and that also provides more flexibility to the contracting authority of the member states for different examples what can be construed as an act of entrustment it could be a concession it could be a franchise for example it could be a ministerial program or instructions a law an act of parliament or act it could be performance contracts by the member state or the government to a specific organization to deliver public services it could be degrees legislative degrees or regulatory decisions or municipal decisions depending how the structure of the member state delivers public services for social services the other side of the coin of the minimum standard of article 9 is even more interested more interested in linking the accessibility requirements with the implementation mountain to climb of <coughs> the procurement requirements for accessibility social services of general interest cover a variety of specific services in member states health services for example life assurance, health, aging, occupational accident services, retirement, and here comes disability. The protocol mentions disability as, as social services. Now, how many states do you know that take advantage of that? Very few, if none. We try a couple of times in the European Commission to persuade, to create an observatory about the provision of services of social economic interest but there was not enough traction there was no interest on the part of the member states i'm afraid to say to embrace the concept of disability the protection of disability as a social service of general interest it also covers social interest services cover other fundamental rights assistance for person face personal challenges or crisis debt unemployment drug addiction and family breakdowns are specifically mentioned social integration activities that relate to rehabilitation language training and also labor market access all of which apply to disabled persons services to integrate people with long-term health or disability problems another item 
How many times you need to see more specific iterations of flexibility? And last and last least relates as part of the accessibility of social services, access to housing or housing for disadvantaged citizens, the accessibility to other parts of life, including living and housing for socially less advantageous groups. More technical stuff here, a bit on the delivery and financing of public service obligations, specifically Article 14 and Article 106, Paragraph 2 of the treaty, focus on one great development from the court. That development is called Altmark. It's a ruling in the mid-2000 that relates into public transport, the Altmark ruling. Case 280 that was decided in 2003. It's a public service license for regional transport services. Does it matter for our case? It does, for one reason. It allows to bypass any competition, state aid requirement I mentioned before, because of the decision of the contracting authority, the government, the member state, to finance this. That means there's no advantage, there's no aid. There's a requirement, a specific requirement, that there must be a compensation approach, that must be a monitoring financing between the state and who delivers these public services. For the case that we spoke about, it's the provision of regional transport services must at least have a set of accounts so anybody to observe the principle of transparency and accountability can see the transfers of funds from the state to that entity to provide transport services. Is that important for us, for our case? I mentioned to you, yes, and I repeat again, it's massively important. Why? Because the intervention of the state creates exclusive rights, meaning transparency and also discretion. It shelters services of general economic interest and also services of social interest from competition. The requirement is that there must be a financial compensation, the, fund, the funding, the financing, which ensures the viability of this service, and the general rules definition in terms of what you expect out of the service, the minimum standard requirement, equalizes the market. The market calibrates in equilibrium, so there's no breach of competition or other requirements under European rules. Imperative also to remember that services of general economic interest and social economic interest have a public service obligation features. That's another wonderful word to remember. The public service obligation, which means that their frameworks are trusted without competition. The state can come to the market, they come to any organization and entrust through act of parliament, through law, through legislative decision, a framework to deliver public services. That means a direct award in contractual terms. There's a contract and there is an award of that contract. That framework is carried through a contract. Subject to strict conditions, that contract cannot be used to further tendering basis across the member state or in other member states. So in other words, that contract cannot subsidize the expansion of a unit that purports to provide public services that in our case relate to accessibility requirements. Last but not least, it requires a transparency for public service contracts through the monitoring of the financing and the elimination of any overcompensation to the provider of public services. 
take a breath, take a breath here, and we go into somehow less complicated but quite intriguing aspect of accessibility requirements through procurement. To have procurement rules apply, we need three specific requirements. One is we need to have a contracting entity or a contracting authority. We need the material coverage, a threshold in other words, a contract above a certain threshold, below a certain threshold, procurement doesn't apply. And of course, we have to have a notion of public contract. So the services that I mentioned to you, they have to be determined through all those three circles you see on the top. The contracting authority, the material coverage, and the public contract. These must be met cumulatively at the same time. If one is missing, procurement doesn't apply. Is that important? Of course it's important. Member states may decide to use the material coverage exemption and drop the contract value below thresholds to avoid procurement, to avoid specific legislations on procurement. After the planets, you know, the circles on the top align, cumulatively requirements of contracting authorities, material coverage, and public contracts, there are other steps that they have to go through to deliver public services through a contract. These steps are advertisement and publicity. Any government, any contracting authority across Europe, they must advertise and publicize the intention to award contracts that deliver public services, period. That's number one priority. That is the most important, fundamental requirement for the transparency for public services. In addition to that, Contracting authorities must specify the contracts, must create the so-called contract specifications. After that, which is quite difficult, and I will explain to you why it's difficult, they have to go through a specific onerous task of selection and qualification. Who will deliver the services? Who will deliver the contract out of uh, the long list, people from your country, people from your municipality, people from another member state. If you enshrine the principle of competition, you can open the doors and say, anybody with an interest, come and deliver services. That's easier said than done. Because member states have different priorities. They have different also perceptions of markets and competitiveness. More to that later on. Following the selection and qualification, we go into the award procedure. How the state, how the government, how the contracting authority will go through the procedure to allow the contractor or the interested party to compete and tender their offer, quality-wise or monetary-wise, for delivering public services. And the last and the most important obstacle to the success of delivering public services is the obstacle of award criteria. This is the moment of truth. This is the moment that every contracting authority is feared of most. What criteria are they going to use to award the contract to contractor A, not to contractor B? In principle, there are two criteria. One is the lowest price, correct? The cheapest price. Whoever comes with the most inexpensive price gets the contract. Do you like that? A lot of member states love it. A lot of member states feel comfortable because it's not subjective. 
It's very numerical. If it's less, you get the price. It doesn't matter how the less is computed. The law doesn't allow that. Whoever comes first with the lowest price gets the contract. And that opens a Pandora's box about how you're going to deliver quality. How are you going to take into account other aspects of policy? Social policy, environmental policy, health and safety, accessibility. These are European policies. These are not national policies only. How this can be bring together Article 9 of the Convention, the Protocol 26, under the premise of the lowest price. Very difficult or impossible. Another criterion for awarding contracts is the so-called MEET. MEET stands for Most Economically Advantageous Standard. That allows not only price, but other qualitative features. <coughs> Some member states love it. The more mature member states in procurement, the bigger member states, they do not like lowest price, but they like meat because they can bring together concepts of policy, horizontal policies. Smaller member states do not like it because there is an element of subjectivity. And quite often, they don't have the resources to combat contest ability before courts. You didn't calculate correct the offering that relates into the observance of accessibility between two offers. Therefore, it creates an ambiguity and creates uncertainty. The directives themselves, I mentioned to you, 2016 will have new instruments that the European Commission thinks that they are pretty good. Well, they are, but not pretty good. They're good. They bring together a lot of experience of member states, a lot of justice decisions from the European Court, and also a lot of developments from the market. In other words, member states best practice. You hear that quite often from me many times. The best practice is another feature of European lawmaking, specifically when it comes to public services. Let me give you examples. One aspect of best practice into the new public procurement directives that relate to our case of accessibility for disabled persons is Article 20. What does it tell us? It tells us something about reserved contracts. Have you heard that before? If yes, great. If no, you hear it now. Reserves, reserved contracts are contractual arrangements envisaged by a member state to create a specific public service destined for integrating disabled people, sheltered from competition. Magic. Fantastic. You can enter the market successfully, compatibly with European law, without breaching anything, if you allow the opportunity of Article 20 to be the basis of your contractual arrangement. You can have more innovative solution you can provide at least 30% of the employees for workshops or intervention into the marketplace are disabled or disadvantageously bad workers. That's the first step. It's not everything, but it's a good first step towards minimum standard and integrating Article 9 into the cause of accessibility. Another part of integration approach, another part of the ability 
of discretion on the part of the member state is Article 62 of the directives, which allows for quality assurance standards. You never heard that. Well, no, it's quite, let's say, technical and relatively boring to say about quality assurance and also accessibility, but the directive, our good directive that came into force in 2016, focuses on creating or forcing member states to accept standards quality assurance standards that have not only environmental management standards, but also assurance that attests accessibility for disabled persons. That's the first time in the public sector procurement directives we have accessibility as a standard. Great. Minimum standards? Yes. And this is another demonstration of best practice. Coming from member states, I suspect this is a French intervention. I suspect the minimum standard for the accessible disabled, let's say, requirements comes from France. But also, member, the, the bigger member states, Germany, and to a lesser extent, the United Kingdom, also provided positive reinforcement of that insertion of standards as a quality assurance. In practice, it means everything. Unless you have the standard, there's no need to participate in the contract. Please go away. So it's a type of minimum har harmonization that allows the market to create acceptance. Acceptance of what is the condition for delivering public services. As a minimum, it should be accessible. This is a victory for the cause of accessibility. For technical specifications into a contract, it also requires specific aspects that relate, for example, to labels. You know labels? You've seen products with specific label that the label attests to specific features of a product or a service. Nothing prevents accessibility to have a label. And we see quite often labels for accessible service or standards in many transport, public transport, elevators, or other infrastructure in member states. There's a caveat here that the label must ensure the principle of competition, must ensure that whatever happens in the marketplace, the label must not foreclose must not create discriminatory condition. The label must be accessible to everybody that meets the minimum requirement, the minimum standard. And the question you could ask me, I said, Chris, who will provide the minimum standard certification? Well, that's another question that the European Commission and also the European Parliament have failed to come with the one solution. It could be a national body to attest to qualify, to say that your offer, your accessibility offer, means the minimum standard, you can have the label. It could be better, a European body covering all national requirements for minimum harmonization to put the label behind a product or behind a service that regulates accessibility. Technical specifications also for the provision of service that relates to accessibility or works that relate to accessibility focus also on functional requirements. You don't have to have a specific requirement that relates into, for example, a standard. And you know, standards are quite often dominating the words of contracts. Without a standard, you cannot sell anything. You cannot sell in the market this glass without meeting certain standard requirements. Because this could be made out of glass, recycled glass, it could be made out of plastic, it could be made out of crystal. A variety of options. However, in our case, for accessibility, it could be even better if we have Functional requirements. Let me give you an example. Conversion of an old listed building. 
in one of your capitals of member state. Not new build, but something which is old. A public building designed and built last century, or the century before. <coughs> that didn't have specific accessibility requirements. Ramps, elevators, other issues that relate into ICT technology. You could use flexibility of functional standards to create what is the accessibility requirement on the part of the contracting authority. However, these parameters, this framework for the functional requirements, for standards for access in favor of disabled persons, must allow whoever determines to provide the service or the works to link that with the subject matter of the contract, not abstract, not creating essay write paper about functionality, about accessibility of disabled people in uh, architecturally protected buildings. Precise, detailed ways to allow access for getting into the building, evacuating the building in case of hazard, and also providing access to all services provided in the building that is, for example, created or built a few hundred years ago. You heard me say before that the most painful part of procurement, the most painful part of contract awards, is the award criteria. And in our case, for contracts or contractual arrangements that ensure accessibility requirements for disabled persons, award criteria are captured in Article 67 of the Public Sector Directive. That relates into mainly the most advantageous tender, the meet criterion. The meet criterion is the only criterion that can deliver safely and without any prejudice accessibility requirements that correspond not only to the United Nations Convention for the Protection of Disabled Rights, rights of disabled persons, but also Article 14 and Protocol 26 of the treaty. However, the award criteria, based on the most economically advantageous tender, must be linked to the subject matter of the contract and specifically create characteristics for environmental protection or social considerations. This is the other opening that I'm putting in front of you here for flexibility, for delivering accessible public services. The social consideration that is allowed specifically under meet award criteria is a door opening for Article 9 interpretation into public procurement. Through inherent flexibility in the award of public contracts, accessibility requirements can be safely, legally, and compliantly delivered across member states. Flexibility also is the friend of policy pursuits. Not only accessibility as a policy itself, but also integration, social integration, and also equality, fair treatment, fundamental principles of the European Union as applicable to all persons, all persons, all citizens of the Union. Last but not least, the last aspect of procurement requirements in accessibility conundrums across the member states is the award criteria which is based on not only the price but also the cost effectiveness approach but also using a best price quality ratio 
to deliver a basis for a contract that purports to carry public services. This is a new idea, this is a new thinking process on the part of the European Commission to move away from the lowest price. Many member states, specifically the central European states, are, pardon my phrase, addicted to the lowest price. They cannot move away from the lowest price being the benchmark, the criterion for any contractual interface. The European Commission is trying hard, credit to them, to emphasize a price quality ratio. Perhaps meat is not ready yet available for their conceptual interface in member states to accept. But the best quality price ratio, it's something between that can dilute the harshness of the lowest price and the dangers of the lowest price by taking away the quality and focuses on aspects of quality, aspects of minimum standards, aspects of accessibility compliance. And of course, everything comes to the performance of the contract. Many member states have huge transparency requirements also attached to the contract prior to the conclusion. But after the conclusion of the contract, the whole interface goes private. The contract is concluded. The contract is signed. What does it mean? Legally, it means that you can expect specific performance requirements out of the contract. You can use, in other words, KPIs. KPI stands for Key Performance Indicators. That they can be imposed as performance conditions to the contractor, public or private, to deliver an envisaged service for accessibility, for improvement of accessibility, for quality, for regularity of service. The list goes on. The imagination of the state, the government, the contracting authority can capture Article 70 requirements and make the most out of it post-procurement, after the conclusion of the contract. How many member states, how many contracting authorities take advantage out of that? Not many. Again, it's a lack of imagination, lack of brave character to say, yes, we can create a new approach in delivering public services and for once, integrating accessibility requirements into public services. And of course, there's the light regime. The procurement directives allow for a very light, soft touch regulatory regime for social health, cultural, and other services. And the thresholds of these services is three quarters of a million per contract. You can bring a lot of good things and innovation through that concept of the light regime <coughs> that requires traditional approaches in delivering public services, but mainly through best price quality or meet most economically advantageous award criteria approaches. It covers not only social health and cultural services, but also takes into account other priority services in the member states, such as hotel and restaurant services, legal services, rescue firefighting, and, listen to that, government services and services to the community. Oh, another music in your ears. You can capture a lot of services under that last iteration of the light regime. How many member states know that? Not many. Again, another failure of disseminating the flexibility of the regime and the rules into what can be done in reality. I finish by providing you some good news. Good news in terms of policy making. The European Disability Strategy in, established in 2010, which builds under the United Nations Convention, and takes into account a priority plan, a disability action plan, 
that focuses on concrete objectives, eight objectives. Accessibility is number one, participation, equality, employment, education and training, social protection, health, and external action, dissemination. This is good news. However, how does this translate it into the accessibility minimum standard? And here we come into the proper auditing of the promise of the member states to adhere to the convention and also to the ACQI, including procurement. How many states have mandatory accessibility standards for national and local authority building? 15 only mandatory, the rest are not. The partially or non-information. Austria, Belgium, Czech Republic, Denmark, Finland, France, Hungary, Ireland, Italy, Lithuania, Luxembourg, Poland, Portugal, Spain, and the United Kingdom are mandatory, meaning non-negotiable. Either you're in or you're out. Either you provide that as a minimum requirement, mandatorily, or you're not participating in any contract for accessibility of public service. Cyprus, Germany, Greece, and Sweden allow for exception for partial application. Germany, believe it or not, does not have mandatory standards for accessibility into public or municipal buildings. And Slovenia, Bulgaria, Estonia, Croatia, Latvia, the Netherlands, Malta, Romania, and Slovakia, they didn't bother sending any information. In other words, either they haven't even started the process of converting the standards into mandatory or minimum standard, or uh, they have done something and they forgot to deliver the information. You take which one you believe. A last development that also provides some hope for the future, for the next legislative sessions of the European Parliament, is Directive 2016 of 2012, sorry, it's a mistake, 2012, on the accessibility on the websites and mobile applications of public sector bodies. That directive corresponds into not only infrastructure accessibility, but also ICT infrastructure for disabled persons and people with impairments uh, for integration characteristics in public life. As a result, I believe that the concept of uh, accessibility is coming as a priority for the new parliament and the new commission after the May elections, will translate that as a key action. Procurement is one concept that we deliver public services and that will carry out the accessibility requirement of the convention as a minimum standard. That's a good start. We have already proof that this is going to happen. It's happening now and it's going to continue. The gap is uniform application of accessibility, not only as a minimum standard, but as a higher standard. We like minimum standard because it's an insurance policy, but we need that standard of a minimum classification to lift it, to move it higher, to make it more accessible, not because of the minimum requirement, but because of the necessity of equality, integration, and fair treatment. It rings a bell? Yes. This is exactly what Europe is made about. I'd like to thank you again for your attention, for your attendance, and all your wonderful remarks that uh, you have provided all this uh, great event. I look forward to any comments or any questions you might have. Again, thank you. Thank you, Duara. And Godspeed. Thank you.